Welcome back. We hope you had a great evening, depending on your time zone, and time to digest all of the impressions from yesterday. It's been so fascinating for us to walk down memory lane of this conference, and um, the Sharing is Caring anthology is also part of Sharing is Caring's history. So if you want to dive more into the history of Open Glam and Sharing is Caring, you can find this um, online. It's licensed under CC BY. And um, yeah, you just search for Sharing is Caring Anthology. Um, lots of great um, talks and uh, debates from the Sharing is Caring back program here. So today, we have a wonderful program once again for you. Um, we'll start with um, our two keynotes of today, Kati Hüppe and Susanna Stanska, who will open up the wondrous world of creative reuse of our open collections. After that, um, and the keynotes in conversation, of course, we have a break and then we dive into the Sharing is Caring 10-year anniversary quiz. That will lead us on to uh, the Ignite session of today. Um, and finally, we will have um, a visit from Perth, Australia of George Oates for a look back at the history of Open Glam and um, ways forward for um, our work. So, um, yeah, it's a day of history and future. Hi to you all again. My name is Christina, and like I did yesterday, I will monitor the chat. So please post your questions and comments there. Mareta will facilitate the conservations with the keynotes and ignites. So please don't hold back, but ask away, and we'll do our best to bring forth as many of your questions as possible. If you want to post a question or comment to a particular speaker, please just mention the speaker's name along with the comment or question. And again, please keep a respectful tone and open mind towards fellow participants when engaging in discussions. Yeah, and we really appreciate it how you took part in yesterday's conversations, both during the conference and uh, in the after hours on WonderMe. Today, again, we greatly encourage you to join the debate and also, of course, to join the after party. We'll get back to that. But now, um, a little bit ahead of schedule, I believe we will uh, invite Kati Hüppe, our first keynote of the day, um, to give her speech. Kati Hüppe is a Finnish Berlin based artist and educator who works at the intersection of art and technology. Her practice is rooted in materiality and handmaking. Working with materials from recycled objects and electronics to textiles and open cultural content, she, expo she explores alternative perspectives on our material and technological surroundings. As you're about to experience with your own eyes and ears and senses, her projects often include an element of participation, speculation and humor as a means to invite people in a closer, alternative dialogue with technology. Please enjoy Katy's keynote with the aptly creative title, where open cultural content, motors, drilling machines and hot glue meet. In Katy's workshop, everything can happen. Hello everyone, my name is Kati Hyppä. 
We are here in our studio home in East Berlin. I work here with my partner Niklas Roy, who is behind the camera. We make projects which are somewhere between art, technology and maker culture. Our workbench includes drilling machines, pliers, screwdrivers, hot glue, soldering irons, an oscilloscope, a sewing machine and much more. With these tools and various different types of materials, we build installations and objects, which often have a geeky look and a playful character. To celebrate the 10 year anniversary edition of Sharing is Caring, in this presentation, I will look back at some projects that were inspired by open cultural content from museums and archives. I wish to share with you my experiences in how digital items such as images and sound can land on the physical workbench and become part of multi-material creative practices. In 2014, I took part in an open culture hackathon called Coding Da Vinci, which is organized here in Berlin. As I went there, I discovered a very welcoming, enthusiastic, happy atmosphere. So it was easy to get excited about the open collections. Although I knew already something about open collections because I had worked with them previously at the Media Lab Helsinki. So that made it really easier also to enter the hackathon. I was particularly impressed by the amazingly high resolution scans of insect boxes, which the local natural history museum had provided for the hackathon. And I was zooming into these large, large files that my computer was almost crashing when I was opening them. But I found a really gorgeous beetle called the Atlas beetle that I really wanted to work on. After the initial meeting at the hackathon, I returned to the workbench. I worked several weeks with different kinds of materials like wood and electronics. And the outcome was Cyber Beetle, who resides in his personal wooden insect box. He gets occasionally out to make a walk or to watch entertainment programs on his flat screen TV, which he has on the back of his box. The animation on his TV was made using photos from Berlin's Botanical Museum, along with some animal sounds from the Natural Histories collection. My brother Tommy turned these sounds into a cyber beetle song, which is the soundtrack of the video. But at the beginning of the project, it wasn't really clear what was exactly going to come out of it, because all I had was a vague vision. So gradually, all the materials came together step by step doing little experiments, such as testing a walking mechanism or an infrared sensor. And some experiments were more successful than others, but that's how it always is. There were absolutely no practical goals with Cyber Beetle. There was really just a desire to bring this imaginary character alive. And had there been some practical goals, Cyber Beetle would probably never have been born. Eventually, Cyber Beetle returned to his roots at Berlin's Natural History Museum when he was scanned to their insect collection. He even made a TV appearance at the German children's program called Erde an Zukunft. But Cyber Beetle was not designed to be shown in events or exhibitions. In fact, demonstrating him requires quite some careful tinkering with switches and batteries or otherwise it might turn into a smoky ride. Oh. In later open content projects, I took practicalities related to exhibitions also better into account. Forbidden Fruit Machine is an installation which enables people to interact with a 16th century painting with a popular 80s gaming joystick. This project we made together with Niklas on our free time, using largely materials that we have here at home, some of which are recycled from old projects. We have actually quite a large material archive of our own, with lots and lots of boxes tacked with metadata. The idea for the installation emerged when I was thinking rather generally 
what kind of physical objects could be made from images of old paintings, as there are many such items in open collections. So in this case, it was the medium, an oil painting, in contrast to the contemporary media formats, which inspired the work rather than a specific collection. The painting chosen for the installation was The Fall of Man by Cornelis Cornelison van Haarlem, which is part of the Rijksmuseum's open collection. It depicts Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, where the serpent is tempting them to eat the forbidden fruit. This theme provided a familiar narrative, which we could build upon. Furthermore, the various characters in the painting provided elements which could be explored with the joystick, like targets on a game. The sounds used in the installation were from free sound, free music archive and internet archive, which we use frequently to find audio files for our projects. Forbidden Fruit Machine has visited different events. At Mega Fair Berlin, we were positively surprised when lots and lots of children queued up to engage with Van Harlem's 16th century masterpiece. Hmm? Always wear safety gear when giving conference presentations. Later, in 2015, I had the pleasure to be part of the Mix It Up exhibition, in which artists and designers remixed the open collection of SMK, the National Gallery of Denmark. I chose to work with an image of Wilhelm Hammershoi's painting called Interior in Strandgade, Sunlight on the Floor, from 1901. It is one of the major works in the museum's collection. The painting is characterized by an intriguing, dreamy light shining through a window, which is a recurring theme in Hammershoi's works. Looking at the painting, I imagined how time would pass in the room. Following this very immediate, powerful impression, I built a small electromechanical machine called As Light Goes By. It recreates the light coming through the window and moves the light pattern across the floor over and over again through a self-switching motor mechanism. Seeing the little machine in the exhibition at SMK next to the original painting was very special and naturally also a great honor. In fact, as light goes by, wouldn't be much anything without the original painting by its side, as it relies on the shared appreciation of the atmosphere in Hammes Hoy's painting. What is common to all these past projects is that they were built using a mixture of different materials and techniques, such as woodwork, electronics, 3D printing, and of course, hot gluing. They all reanimate digital archival items, which traveled from the computer screen to the maker's head, from the head to the hands, and eventually back to the physical world where the items originated. But the journey does not end there, as the projects are also documented online. Following the practices of makers all over the internet, we share images, videos, circuit schematics and other materials of our projects. We have learned a lot from others and we also like to contribute our share. Accustomed to using open licenses, we publish our materials so that others can reuse them. However, it seems that open licenses, such as Creative Commons licenses, are not always compatible with existing publishing policies and conventions in the art world. There may be existing content systems, artist contracts and other procedures which don't include the option to use an open license. Yet, wouldn't it be desirable to have more open content also from artists who are still alive? We can already learn a lot about open practices from the maker and hacker communities, as well as from the Open Glam initiatives. Using this knowledge, we could think ways and incentives to engage more current and future artists in open practices. 
There are also other items to share than final artworks, such as sketches and documentation of studio practices, which could provide interesting insights into how artists work. Hackathons and workshops are also a great way to promote the use of open cultural content in a shared, enthusiastic atmosphere. In such events, people with various backgrounds can meet, adding ideally diversity to the open community. Together with my colleagues, I've given lots of different kinds of DIY workshops, some of which included open images, videos and sounds. In my experience, formats such as animated GIFs work well, as they are playful, fairly quick to make and easy to share online. During the pandemic, we've also seen many charming reenactments of famous paintings, which people put together using objects that they found at home. It would be generally nice to see more open-ended exploration of the open collections without thinking too much of goals or practical applications. There is value in creative exploration itself. To facilitate this kind of activities, artists and designers could share their skills of looking at items from unconventional or surprising perspectives. And makers could share their vast knowledge of hands-on work and experimentation, which is equally important when developing an idea. Digital techniques such as machine learning offer interesting possibilities to explore large collections, but it would be still nice to see some use of the workbench, as hands are an essential part of being a homo sapiens. It can be a pleasure to get away from the screen and use a cordless drill for a while instead. One challenge in engaging younger generations with open content might be how to explain what open cultural content actually is. For someone who's grown up using just about everything that's available online, what we may call an open collection may not seem so open, but even limited and unnecessarily complicated. To bridge such generation gaps, we need to hear more opinions and ideas from young people beyond the traditional classroom settings, to let them teach us rather than the other way around. Lastly, I'd like to encourage people to get creative, not just with the open collections, but also with open licenses. We use the Creative Commons Attribution License a lot, but another one of our favorites is the Beerware License by Paul Henning Kamp. And it essentially says you can use a software freely, but if you would in person bump into the author one day, you are encouraged to buy them a beer. The license seems to work in reality, as we also got a couple of drinks by now. I also once made a DIY license for an online doodle archive called Creature Party, which I published with the help of my friend Katrin and my brother Tommy. This license is called Be Nice License, and it wishes that in return of using the images, one would do something nice for someone else, such as help with the groceries. In the end, many creators and makers aren't probably that much into complicated legal texts. They just like to share what they do and keep up a good atmosphere. Thank you for your attention. Bye! Well, what can I say? Katzi, I'm going to buy you a beer next time I meet you. Thanks for this brilliant presentation to kick off day two of Sharing is Caring 2021. And we can definitely say that the theme we discussed yesterday of the sheer value of playfulness is on the, uh, on the table again today. Now we're going to Poland to meet Susanna Stanska. She is an art historian fascinated by using emerging technologies in museums. In 2012, 
She founded Museum, a tech consultancy helping museums and cultural institutions to reach their audiences with new tools. And the same year, she also founded the popular app Daily Art, which will be the center of her keynote here at Sharing is Caring. In her young life, she has built an impressive track record, serving as an advisor to the European Commission's Digital Cultural Heritage and Europeana Expert Group, winning the British Council Young Creative Entrepreneur Award in the culture category and being mentioned on the New Europe Top 100 Challenges list, to name a few. In a minute, you'll know why. Please welcome Susanna Stanska. Hello, everyone. My name is Susanna Stanska, and it's such an honor and pleasure to be here in this virtual environment. Uh, but before we start, uh, you don't see that, but my cat is sitting behind my back. Here, this fluffy ball. So if he will do anything or if anything will happen, it's because of him. Uh, it won't be my fault. So I'm sorry in advance. Um, I'm the CEO and founder of Daily Art, and in my presentation I will tell you the story of how this uh, like pretty small educational startup became a regular business. Uh, but first I need to tell you what is Daily Art. Daily Art for years was only a mobile app available for iOS and Android. Uh, you can download it for free on your smartphones and tablets. It presents one piece of fine art with a short story. Simple as that. It also has some additional features like the archive, search, favorites, uh, but they are fully available in the premium version of the app, which costs around six euros now. If you don't want to buy it, you still the access to all the daily features. You just need to swipe left and see all the ugly ads that are there. Um, I founded it uh, in 2012 and now the app is available in 18 languages and reaches around 800,000 people. Uh, a month. The main ingredient of the daily arts is the content. We use public domain art mostly because of obvious financial reasons, uh, but sometimes we get the permissions for contemporary art and we feature it as well. Uh, the texts are written by us or by the guest authors or we get them from our partners, museums, galleries, libraries, private collections, archives, actually anyone who has uh, any content we can share, uh, which can be interesting for our users, of course. So how we do it? Our main goal is to make our users happy. So we contact the museums or they contact as well, contact us as well. Uh, and we offer them uh, to promote their collections or temporary exhibitions in the app, sometimes also in the magazine uh, or as well in the social media, um, our social media. Uh, we credit uh, the institution everywhere, we tag them, we mention them, we link them, um, we share um, their collections uh, not only in the app but also in our social media accounts, um, which is kind of a huge thing for us as well. Um, we also do the translations uh, of the texts uh, for the pieces we feature and we do all that for free. We only need to get from the institution the image uh, in a proper resolution and the text of the description in English. So, uh, so far we have been working with dozens of institutions from all parts of the world. Um, I can mention here like Van Gogh Museum, Consistorius Museum, Europeana, the Louvre, Rijksmuseum. Uh, when it comes to Denmark, we have been working with Staten Museum for Kunst, sorry for my pronunciation, uh, and Skagen's museum as well. And as you can see here on the screenshot, um, that is a piece from uh, our monthly partnership with SMK, where for a month, every Sunday, we were presenting a masterpiece from their collection. And we say that, as you can see here, in the first very f first sentence of the description. So this is the core of everything. Uh, but you probably would like to know how it all started. Um, so here you can see the first and the ugliest version of the app from 2012. Uh, it was very simple, very gray, very cheap, very ugly. I mentioned that, that it was ugly. Uh, I, can't, I can't look at it right now, actually. 
Um, so in this 2012, I had this idea to create, a, create an app which would teach art history in a simple and pleasant way. I thought that art history is perceived by many to be too, too complicated or too encyclopedic or too boring. Um, especially among those who didn't study art history um, in schools, for example. I'm based in Poland um, and I had art history in school because it was a private school. But in public schooling, art history is actually absent. So I wanted to change that whole story. Um, and mobile apps seem to be perfect for such a goal. So I invested, I invested all the money I had then. Uh, I was creating mobile apps for museums at the time. So I put all my earnings uh, for my first pro project uh, into this. I thought that the app won't ever earn any money. Uh, so there wasn't any business model behind it until uh, 2014. You know, I, th I thought that why would anyone would like to pay for art history? Uh, but the app seemed to be interesting for some and some huge media outlets featured it and wrote articles about it. That gave us the initial users who love the app. Um, they sent us emails, they wrote reviews, um, they contacted us through social media and it still works like this. It hasn't changed. Um, and as you can see on Google Play and App Store, we have marvelous reviews, thousands of them, actually. Uh, right now we are having around five stars in each of these store of rating, which is amazing, amazing thing. So these were the humble years of 2012 and 2018. Uh, we were barely earning any money uh, in that years. Uh, as I've mentioned in 2014, I've introduced um, the Ina purchase in the app, but it hardly covered the costs. So not to mention any investments or growing process, nothing. But everything changed in December 2018 um, when we have introduced the translations. So as I've mentioned before, right now we have 18 languages in the app. And in 2018, when uh, we have introduced the first five new languages, um, we knew there won't be a way back. Uh, it became an avalanche. Uh, we are available in some huge languages right now, like Chinese, Arabic, Hindi, Spanish, Portuguese. So masses of people speak these languages. Um, and thanks to them, everything grew like crazy. <laughs> you know, before that, I thought that... Um, you know, English is lingua franca, everyone speaks English, uh, so why to bother with some other languages? But uh, I haven't realized that uh, most of the people would love to read about art history, but not necessarily in a foreign language, which would be English for them. So uh, some massive doors opened for us with the introduction of new languages. So here you see uh, the data of our user groups before uh, 2018 and 2020. As you can see, before 2018, most of our users came from USA, and it was around 20%. And developed countries like Germany, UK, France. Uh, now uh, we have only 12% of uh, the users from the US and around the same number comes from China. Uh, which is even more interesting uh, because we don't have the access of the for, uh, we don't have the access to the Chinese Android market because we don't have the Chinese license and Google services are blocked there. So all these people come uh, comes only from iOS uh, app. So every month around 50, 60 percent of our downloads on iOS comes from China. Um, it's an amazing market. And it, op it was open for us uh, thanks to introduc introducing the Chinese um, language in the app in both versions, simplified and traditional one. Uh, so right now we have much more diverse audience. Uh, without the translations, we wouldn't reach the countries such as Brazil, Turkey, Russia. Um, it was a very good move <laughs> for us. Um, because what's the most important, the number of our users and downloads grew like hell. So on iOS, as you can see, uh, 
we have 500 uh, percent downloads more and on Android, like on average, 200 percent uh, downloads more. Thanks to the translations, we were also we are also often featured by the stores, App Store and Google Play, which gives us not only the eternal fame, but as well we are more and more visible in the stores. Uh, so if you write art in the App Store or Google Play uh, search, it's highly probable that we will be there on the first, second or third position. So this is how everything looks like now. Um, thanks to that growth, we are able to invest in new products. Now, in Daily Arts family, we have the app, we have the Daily Art magazine, which is an online magazine with regular articles about art. It's much wider than Daily Art app. Uh, we have Daily Art shop, where we sell physical paper goods of Daily Art, such as calendars or notebooks. Uh, we have also daily, daily Art courses with online art history courses, written ones not recorded ones. Um, I have put on the slide also our social media channels because they are very important um, for us to reach people who are not and wouldn't be ever in the app or in the magazine because they are interested in something completely different, in a completely different content. Um, thanks to that growth, we also grew uh, as a company. On a daily basis, uh, we have six members um, of the core team and we are all women there, which is kind of interesting. Uh, we are also having more than 60 writers who write for Daily Art magazine, 60 writers and proofreaders, uh, and more than 300 volunteers who help us to translate and proof the app in these 18 languages. So before 2018, we were mostly bootstrapping and crowdfunding a little. Uh, but after this year, we are fully profitable and we are doing fine without any external funding and we can invest in new stuff and grow more. So this presentation was about the business. So I also need to tell you a bit more about it <laughs> itself. It's very simple. Um, in terms of earning money. Uh, in Daily Art app, as I've mentioned, we have an in-app purchase, oh, which costs around six euros, uh, which gives you the eternal access to the app without any limits. We also display ads and we earn money from that. Uh, if you don't have the premium version, we uh, also get some donations, which is super cool for us because it means that people care about us. In Daily Art Magazine, we display ads. Uh, in Daily Art Courses, we sell courses for money, of course, but we also have some basic free courses as well. Uh, and in the Daily Art Shop, we just sell physical products. That's the simplest thing. And yeah, I forgot to mention that right now with our whole uh, Daily Art family, with all of our channels and products, we reach around 1 million people a month uh, in that 18 languages or only in English uh, around million people uh, in a month reads stuff about art history I'm pretty proud of that <laughs> so as this presentation was supposed to be about business I wanted to end with the money slide and with that million number slide so thank you so much for listening. Here are my Twitter account and my email address. If you would like to get in touch, ask about anything, discuss anything, I don't know. Here are the details uh, and the contact. Uh, so thank you very much. I'm happy that my cat was pretty calm. Thank you. Welcome back. And thank you so much, Susanna, for uh, you're a very inspiring talk. We have a lot to learn from you in your approach to uh, making open collections flourish as a business. It's wonderful to have both of you um, in the studio here uh, with us. Yeah, better with the light on, Susanna. <laughs> Great. <laughs> um, and I'd like to just start out with a very open question. I guess I'm like that. I, I start with big open questions. Um, 
And uh, let's start with, uh, with you, Kati. Looking back 10 years, how has the glam sector changed or adapted to the surrounding world, do you think? Hello, everyone uh, around the world. Uh, and thank you for having me as part of the conference. Um, I think probably other people in this conference are better to answer that question because I feel I'm a bit on the outskirts. But, yeah, that's um, why I wanted your opinion <laughs> about it, actually. <laughs> but um, at least, yeah, there are just millions of um, collections out there. I mean, there has uh, been a lot of work done that there is lots and lots of uh, interesting material to work with i would say from from my perspective as a someone who would be interested to do something with it <laughs> and how about you susanna when you look back 10 years um and the whole journey of developing daily art um how has uh, how has the response from the sector changed in your perspective <laughs> okay, I'm what unmuted now. <laughs> yeah. Hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting me here. It's such a pleasure. Uh, but Mareta, answering your question, I think that a lot of things um, changed uh, for the past 10 years. Um, first of all, uh, the museums see that uh, being open and having their collections online is necessary for their being. So a lot of collections are open now. Um, regarding the contact with the museums, it still depends on, on the people. Uh, it's not about uh, some strategy of the institution or anything like this. It's uh, more about having a good contact with someone who is interested in sharing uh, the collection, even on a very low level, like sharing the collection with Daily Art app. So it changed and it hasn't changed as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see if we ask out into our um, people participating in the conference today what they'd like to ask you about. Christina, do you have some um, yeah, questions from the audience? Coming in here. We have one for Katty from Henriette Ruhl. Katty, how diverse is your experience of maker slash hacker spaces? Is there room for everyone here, or is there a stereotypical group dominating this space too? Well, um, I only sometimes visit sort of other maker or hacker spaces because we have this space here. So um, I'm, I'm not a regular visitor, although there are uh, quite a few spaces in Berlin, for example. Uh, I have personally the experience that I always felt welcome. So. I cannot say about the diversity in detail, but um, in general, uh, if I go to a um, hacker event or so, I think it is a very uh, welcoming atmosphere. But, but do you think it's also um, like anyone, uh, regardless of, of skills, will feel, you know, able to walk into that space? Mm, I guess, um, yeah, if it's a smaller space with existing uh, community who know each other well, of course, you can feel a little bit, um, do, do you need to put maybe some effort to get in there? But I think if it's a bigger event, I think that is really part of the philosophy that everyone is welcome. Mm. So, yes, I, it depends a little bit. Yeah, it comes a little bit back to what we were also discussing yesterday in terms of um, uh, people with uh, a cultural heritage background, how um, well equipped we feel to start programming and coding and doing stuff with our own uh, open collections. Um, I think it's, it's an interesting uh, question from Henriette, uh, that there are some, some bridges to gap, gaps to, what's it called? <laughs> some gaps to bridge, yeah? <laughs> yeah sounds okay. <laughs> Do you have uh, another question, Christina? Yes, we have one to um, Susanna from Sam Donville. He asks, how do you achieve multilingual content? Are some parts automatic, semi-automatic? Where do you have harvest data from? Institutional databases, Wikidata? He want to know how you do it. 
Yeah, everything. I can see that. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a good, it's a good question. Uh, so um, every daily art initially is written in English. And when we get the text from the institution, we get the English version. Um, then uh, we have a huge base of translators who are our users. There are volunteers who want to help us with the translations and they do their translations uh, for the app. And as well, when we don't have um, um, the text translated yet, for example, it's a very old arch archival text from the past, um, we have a feature of Google Translate. So the user can use it, uh, use the machine uh, if he wants to. Uh, but most of all, we are um, having this huge luck to have um, like right now around 200 people who are helping us with translations. Cool. I hope I answered the question. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, you can uh, continue the conversation uh, on Twitter or elsewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so your approaches obviously are very, very different. Uh, but there's one thing that uh, struck me when I uh, when I watched your keynotes is that you're both mediators between glams and users. And uh, well, we all strive to be more relevant to users. What can you tell me about the users? What can you tell us? What are their needs? What are their dreams? What they what do they want? Yeah, um, I can start if mm -hmm. it's, please if it's fine, Bugatti. Um, so I think that most of all they are very curious. Uh, they really want to know new things. They want to uh, look at art they don't know, or they want mm -hmm. to see something they have previously seen somewhere. But they're very curious and they want to ask questions. Um, mm -hmm. And they want to see how art is relevant to the nowadays lives. Um, how does it respond to contemporary problems or to contemporary situation, which is pretty grave, <laughs> as we all know. Um, so I really think they want to um, feel occupied with um, the content uh, we produce or uh, the institutions produce. How about you, Katy? Well, um, I always find it rather difficult to explain to other people what this uh, open cultural collections is if they are or not already familiar with it, maybe also in this context of uh, making more physical things and uh, and try to say like, hey, there are these websites, maybe you can have a look, there are some cool materials, but it's, it's a bit hard to explain um, just like that. <laughs> you need some examples. And uh, I'd also wondered about this terminology. This somehow reminded me this question of what Henrietta said yesterday about sort of communities who might be using this kind of collections. Uh, I think she mentioned few, few that, oh, what to call these communities? Are they amateurs or ambassadors or I like the one super interested people I think was one if I remember correctly so basically that is also uh, I, I know this problem for myself like um, I guess it makes things more concrete if you try to address a certain community and use certain terminology or name but in the end you might be excluding a lot of people by this also so like how to keep this kind of um, open feeling that everyone is welcome regardless of whether they're somehow professional in certain field or if they really want to do as a hobby if they want to study family history or if they just want to print a t-shirt because this is such a still a if we think all the people who's potentially interested is, is a very, very uh, big group of people with different backgrounds. So I think um, this is one challenge also. I, I see more like challenges this, how to introduce the collection and how to, how to like, uh, yeah, hmm. name people who, <laughs> or do we have to even, maybe we can call just friends of open collections, or open cultural Beautiful. heritage, maybe are all just friends. <laughs> Yeah, and what I also really um, get from your presentations is that um, it seems users really want to enjoy themselves, um, have fun, um, be, you know, 
well entertained with something with substance. Um, so uh, I think that's a, it's an important takeaway for us. Um, Christina, I know you have some more questions from the chat. Yeah, uh, there are quite some interests still in um, translations. <laughs> Both uh, okay. Oates and Sam Donwell asks uh, if the translations flows back to the institution somehow. And Saskia Skelton also asks, what if the institutions doesn't have English metadata? So uh, that's a super interesting question because nobody ever asked us about the translations. We would share them uh, with a pleasure, but nobody ever asked, <laughs> <laughs> which is funny because we are translating the content to 18 languages, right? To 17 languages from uh, mm. English right now. So that nobody ever cared. <laughs> it's horrible, actually. <laughs> Um, and uh, sorry, what was the second question? Um, it was if the institution doesn't have English metadata. Oh yeah, what was going on? Yeah. Um, so in very rare situations when we really care about this particular uh, piece from a collection uh, that we desperately want to have that thing in daily art, <laughs> we uh, we do the translations by ourselves, but don't tell that anyone. <laughs> don't, don't tell that to anyone. <laughs> yeah. Um, Anita Vreind, I hope that's how you pronounce it. She asked also, did COVID increase your readers? A lot. <laughs> how much? <That's>, um, <laughs> Uh, last year it was around 40 percent, 40 percent in the app, so uh, really a lot. Uh, now um, it's hard to tell because um, because of the whole shift and all the changes, uh, we got um, a huge interest from Apple. So we've been featured um, in the store, in the local app stores, um, plenty of times. So it's really difficult to say what goes naturally because of the situation and what goes because of um, because of the special features from from Apple. But it's really um, I was amazed because you know I was terrified that nobody would like to read about art in the middle of pandemics. <laughs> that it's um, too horrible uh, outside to um, to think about art. But um, I was surprised to see that it was the opposite. Susanna, I'd like you to uh, have a conversation with our Minister of Culture. <laughs> what um, a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> give her a little speech. Um, actually, this, this topic of what has um, been the, uh, the need, the craving for, uh, for art and creativity during um, the pandemic, I'd like also to uh, ask you, Cathy, because art and well-being is an increasingly hot topic and people are looking for handicraft and meditation and community um, also through screens, but you're a big advocate for using um, your hands. Um, how do you try to approach this need um, in your practice? Well, uh, I also do a lot of uh, workshops and some neighborhood activities and things like that. So, yeah, I like to share the joy of, you know, doing something very tangible, whether it's uh, knitting or building something out of wood or electronics or other things. I have the experience that um, people are quite satisfied in this kind of uh, workshops or events uh, where we do something and it really makes a kind of glow in their eyes often. Maybe it's not for everyone, but like um, quite a few people enjoy it. And I think it is in, in, indeed important for our health and um, this kind of having playful activities or somehow laughing together, making something together. I think it's really also can bind people together, doing something together. Um, we know about local crafts, clubs and things like this, which can be quite informal, but people just gather together to do something. Yeah, and a lot of that has been impossible yes. during lockdowns, etc. But Susanna, I know that uh, you've also seen uh, some, uh, some quite interesting things happen uh, you know, through screens uh, during the, the pandemic uh, with daily art? 
Um, sorry, but what do you mean? Well, just um, that you've also seen that people have been craving this um, kind of uh, injection of art and culture. Yeah, yeah, they do a lot. And, um, you know, with surprising um, types of things, for example, uh, at the very beginning of, pandem of the pandemics, we have released um, an article about uh, how um different pandemics in in the in the civiliz civilization uh, were shown in art and that was a huge success for us in terms of uh, of the number of, of readers uh, but at the same time people crave um, articles and pieces of art that uh, were about calming down about meditation about finding peace um, and at the same time, uh, people were looking for fun. As Kathy mentioned, that um, in this difficult time, people really wanted to have some laughs. <laughs> and they made all that um, dress overs. They were presenting themselves as, um, as uh, people from different paintings, for example. We all knew that it was a huge wave. It was such a popular thing last year to do. Um, so very different things uh, that were somehow connected to art, not necessarily about just reading about art or just uh, looking at beautiful paintings or pieces of art, but also doing something uh, creative um, with the images we you know mm. yeah and being part of the the art yourself um yeah christina yeah there's a question more i know yeah there's a whole lot of questions that are pretty technical regarding translations <laughs> maybe you can look at <laughs> at the chat susanna uh but the olivia <laughs> van uh Donslager, i hope that's how you pronounce it asks how do you keep the data up to date Susanna, I guess my um, question is, how do we avoid tombstone data? And that the possibility that the app shows information that differs from data provided by the cultural institution? Well, uh, you know, we are a very small company. Um, we really try to do our best, but we don't have like any huge system of controlling stuff. Um, we are focusing more on having a good translation uh, that is also proofread uh, by someone after um, after the translator. Um, so, but at the same time, we don't have such a huge collection of data because we are just featuring one piece of fine art uh, a day. So it's not a, you know, it's nothing comparing to uh, any small museum's collection. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, we don't have that huge controlling system here. So I, I'm not sure I could answer that. No, totally. Uh, it's, you know, it's interesting because we are so used to thinking about controlling data to hear how um, a different approach uh, to yeah. building an art experience um, can work on different parameters. Yeah, I can. what I can say here is that um, it's very, funny actually that a lot of museum professionals we are uh, talking with um, about sharing their collections uh, they for example uh, forgot to share all the necessary metadata <laughs> so we need to ask about them for example the technique or the size of the masterpiece um, they forgot about that <laughs> they focus on the text which is super fine for us because this is something most important for us as well, but they often forget um, to share that um, type of details. Hmm. That's uh, interesting. So we, Do you know yeah. why? Is it because they assume that you find it yourself or? And you know, uh, sometimes it's quite difficult to find it. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, it's somewhere hidden or it's, it's yeah, or we don't get a piece from the collection that is digitized, but we get a piece from um, from the exhibition, for example, and when we promote um, exhibitions, uh, not the collections. So I have no idea what happens. <laughs> well, we uh, listen and uh, take notes. I know Christina now has another question for Katy. Yeah. 
Francisca Mucha asks, I'm really wondering if reuse of open collection is something that mostly mediators do and users mostly enjoy the newly created remixes. Skills and ideas and reason to reuse content seem to be crucial as Caddy described so nicely. So what, she, what she's asking is, should we be better to give out ideas how to use uh, this content? Um, yeah, re, re, maybe I start with the skills because indeed um, they play a crucial role of what, what you can do in a way. Of course, you can learn new skills, but if you take part, let's say, in a hackathon, there's often not time maybe to use uh, learn completely new skills, but you rather use the ones that you already have. So, um, for example, in my case, when I went to the coding Da Vinci, I didn't know how to work with an API. I, I'm not much of a programmer. So I was like, well, I've got some servo motors. I've got an Arduino. Like it really, the idea stemmed largely also from the skills that I had at the time. And um, I think like I was actually thinking if there exists uh, like a mini tutorials for how you can do different kinds of things, whether it's more digital or physical or something in between with open collections, because there is so, so many other kinds of tutorials uh, available. Anything from, yeah, you want to learn about specific woodwork technique or need a sock, you will just find so many videos of these topics. So I wonder if there are sort of, it might make also sense to make a, rather like a series of small experiments or, or sort of snippets of sort of simple things that you can do that you can start with or, and I think there are also examples on Reich Studio, for example, and this kind of concrete examples. So I think maybe to make it a bit more sort of scalable that if you want to make a mega installation, you can make it, but you can really also print a t-shirt or you can, you know, still work, bring a new perspective to this content uh, with the skills that you have. But yeah, maybe, um, yeah, maybe you can um, tell if there are some tutorials like this, I'd, I'd be interested. So I'd like to ask uh, Susanna a question. Um, daily art is an example of reuse of open collections that actually is able to be a business. <laughs> Glams are dying to become better at that. What can we learn from you? Uh, try to think about money or starve. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, because this is the only reason why I um, came across um, some business model models. Uh, because I was starving. I really needed to have money to feed my cat, which is pretty fat. Um, <laughs> so... Um, I know it's sometimes difficult to um, to think a bit outside of the box, um, but we are living in the times when it's quite needed. We all know that public funding will be cut uh, if it's not already. Um, so, um, yeah, I really um, advise to start thinking about some new business models. Um, you know, I'm, I'm from Poland and here we have some difficulties to think about culture and money. Um, to say that two words in one sentence, <laughs> because culture should be available for free. And uh, I agree. But at the same time, uh, maybe uh, we can think of some services that can be built up on that uh, stuff that is free. Um, and, you know, people need to be paid uh, the creators, um, all the scientists, oh and everyone who's working in the field. So, um, yeah, I would think about that. <laughs> Thanks for the advice. Um, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, totally. Uh, Kathy, um, you, you talk a lot about how um, uh, it's, there's uh, intrinsic value in uh, doing something for the sake of the experiment and for the sake of the fun and the playfulness. Um, but how, how do you work to make a living based on this open approach where you share everything you create? Well, I suppose um, teaching is one way. <laughs> I think this was mentioned in the Ignite session also yesterday by 
Andreas, that he also teaches. <clears throat> so I think this is something um, I do, yeah, quite a lot. And um, then those uh, sort of more free projects are when you have a chance, you do something like this. And um, I also do not, do not have very high costs living here, living in Berlin. Um, yeah, it's it's not so easy, but I guess, for instance, for me, it's a conscious choice to live this way and do the things that I appreciate and I'm interested in. So, yeah, I guess there is really no um, no bigger philosophy behind it. <laughs> Christina, do you have more questions from the chat? Yes, we have Jakob Wang from the National Museum of Denmark. He asked both of you, I consider you guys some of the best examples of what the past 10 years of opening up cultural institution has brought to the world. How do you see the next 10 years of entanglement um, and makers open institutions? Entanglement of makers and open institutions. <laughs> wow. Wow. That sounds very like destiny. <laughs> the crystal ball for you? <laughs> uh, first of all, I'm happy it's not a question about translations. Um, <laughs> no, but it's super important. So seriously, if anyone would have any else, any other questions, please let me know on my email or Twitter. Um, I really hope that it will, this entanglement will uh, be closer and closer. But it's a lot of depends on in the institutions, on the staff working there and money um, spent on the idea. I really hope it will, uh, this dream will come true in the next 10 years as well. How about you, Kati? Well, maybe I return to this uh, idea of that creative exploration is valuable in itself because we live quite, um, I have the feeling when I sometimes do children's workshops or things like that, it's important to write in the funding application that children will learn programming or something like that. And I think we could emphasize also this other type of values or other type of value of this type of cultural heritage. And I think it would be also very important to bring different perspectives like Henrietta was addressing this uh, yesterday with bringing diverse perspectives. I think this could be the next step from like 3D printing uh, statues or, you know, we've explored the kind of new kinds of digital tools or fabrication tools and things to do things, but we could maybe take it a bit, bit word further as a really, really try to bring more diverse perspectives um, and, and learn maybe also ourselves more about the collections that way. But I, I think it does need quite quite some support also that there is an ongoing activity like in the Ignite session yesterday, it was also discussed how you cannot promise very much to people if you only have a project for a certain period of time. So be, building something a bit more long lasting would be good also to keep up good vibes because once you have those people who've had that energy at that point then things can flow quite well but if you are interrupted because there is no resources then I think it's sad. I have like just one summary kind of question for both of you before we wrap up this session. So we've been talking about um, what you can teach us about being relevant to users, but I'd also like to ask you, how can GLAM support the kind of work you do and be more relevant to you? Maybe you want to go first, Susanna. I'm thinking about sharing, <laughs> which uh, you do marvelously here in, on this conference. Um, so, I'm, yeah, for me, it would be just sharing the content, uh, you know, uh, recently I saw some um, bad examples of what is happening, for example, Metropolitan Museum of Art, which is super known for being open and having open collections and doing everything on uh, with the public domain, uh, they started to withdraw uh, the huge resolutions uh, of some paintings on their websites. Um, and I wonder why they started to do that, maybe because of some financial reasons, I don't know. Um, 
but the fact is that, for example, I don't know, half a year ago, it was possible to download a Monet in a very good resolution, and now it's not. Um, a particular it's painting. Helping you. <laughs> it's not helping me, but as well, it's not helping anyone who is more interested in, um, in Monet, for example, <laughs> uh, or, in, or in art history in general. So, um, yeah, sharing being open um i and i also think that it's not for me but for the people in general uh translating stuff to new languages uh translating the descriptions or, or the, yeah the descriptions mostly this would be super uh handful for promoting the content the museum have museum has uh, sorry um and for you know, promoting artists and pieces of art around the world, not only inside one particular country. Uh, yeah, but it's not for me, it's for everyone. <laughs> cool, thanks. Katy, what, how do you think we can become more relevant to you? Mm, well, one thing is like, uh, I usually just document uh, projects on my website because that's what I have. But like, in a way, it would be nice if it would be connected to the original collection somehow. Or, you know, if someone would, would see this, uh, maybe somehow they stumble on the machine that's made of it. Or I could see what other people have made out of collections. Now it's kind of, there is the collection on, on, the, on the website, but not necessarily cross-linking between those projects that use this this kind of uh, content it would be I think interesting to link these more and also maybe to have I mean I think it's great that there are, are hackathons which also some hackathons which ha happen annually there is a kind of continuum and uh, all collections remain there and there are good websites also um, but I think sometimes I feel also there's a bit of um, gap between like I'm a bit between kind of maker culture art somewhere there between so um, I, I don't know if it's uh, so realistic for me to get funding from sort of more traditional art funding call for this type of project where I use other artworks as a basis of my work. Like, I'm not sure if this this open glam scene is so uh, sort of well known there or that this, this could be a great thing to use these collections. So I, I don't really know where where to even apply for funding for something like if I want to really like let's say focus for a year or uh, six months really on some working on this theme I, I would not know where to apply for funding yeah so we could we could tell on the chat during your talk Katty, that people think you're doing stunning amazing mind-blowing work so maybe we should look into ourselves a little bit to find out how we can support the work of people like you <laughs> and um with that, um, thank you very much for uh, being part of this session, both of you, for bringing your uh, experience of actually working with our collections uh, here uh, into our living rooms and offices um, and for really inspiring us. Uh, fantastic. We're running a little bit over time, so I'm going to uh, shuffle uh, the minutes a tiny bit. Uh, because I want to give you a 10-minute comfort break before we return with the Sharing is Caring 10-year anniversary quiz um, and our second Ignite session. So let's say that we meet back here at 1520 CET. Um, enjoy your coffee break and see you in a bit.
Hi again, and uh, now we're back for the Sharing is Caring 10 year anniversary quiz. And this is not just going to be a challenge on your open glam knowledge, but also on our conference technique, because there's, <laughs> there's a, a, a 20 second delay between the live uh, footage here in our studio and the live stream you receive. So let's see how we uh, make that uh, run as smoothly as possible. But uh, yeah, we are going to try. So um, it's yep. on menti.com. So uh, please take your phones yep. and um, look up menti.com. And then there's a code. Yeah, you can see the code in the top of the screen. It's 69316971. So go to minty.com and type in the code and you will be part of the quiz. And we've put on an easy one to start with. <laughs> Just to get you warmed up. Just to get you warmed up, see how this works. This is not a question with the uh, points. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> So you guys, how are you feeling right now? Let's see if we get some... Yeah, good. <laughs> Nervous. No. That's us. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Gla you feel I like feel glam. glam. I want to feel that too. <laughs> Excited, happy. Inspired. Mm -hmm. Good. I, I feel inspired too by the wonderful keynotes we've had this uh, afternoon and um, also just everything we learned yesterday. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty dope. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah, relaxed. That's good. Mm. Cool. Okay. You ready so, for uh, the game to begin? This was the warm up. Thanks a lot. Now, ooh, ooh, nice to see you all. <laughs> Yay, lots of uh, funny, happy faces and animals popping up uh, on the screen here in our studio. Um, we'll be there in a few seconds for you. The first question, what does the acronym GLAM in Open GLAM stand for? Is it gardens, lawns, acres, meadows? Is it galleries, libraries, archives, museums, or get lucky and mix? So actually, you know, glam can feel you, make you feel pretty glamorous. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There was... Um, oh, <laughs> they all knew. <laughs> There was a, a, a speaker at the first Sharing is Caring conference um, whose uh, talk was called a Glamorous Remix. It is. Yeah, it is glamorous. Well, cool, guys. On to the next question. And as you can see, there's extra points for answering fast. How many digitized cultural heritage collections are shared with open licenses globally? Is it more than 700, more than 800, or more than 900? Hmm. Yeah. It's too few anyway, considering yep. the amount of glams <laughs> in the world. <laughs> but it's definitely uh, good that the... Let's see how many it is. It's happening. Ooh. And it's more than 900. Actually, it is. As we all uh, heard yesterday, it was referred to uh, Andrea Wallace and Douglas McCarthy's wonderful spreadsheet, uh, keeping us all updated on uh, the amount of open collections in the world. Okay, moving on to question three. Which of these European cities was the first to host a Sharing is Caring X conference in 2017? Was it, ladies and gentlemen, Stockholm, Hamburg, Amsterdam or Brussels? 
Oh. And mine, the X. Yes. So um, we heard from all of them yesterday, but which one was the first? Do you remember? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Hamburg is a winner. <laughs> Question no. four? Yeah. What year was the Sharing is Caring anthology published? <laughs> <laughs> I'm interested to see if you know this one. And this is a type in question. Yeah. So you have to type in the year. Yeah. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm curious to see how yeah, many <laughs> exactly. <members. laughs> that's, that's quite. Yeah. Let's see. It's a whole lot. Exactly. It was 2014. We published it during the third Sharing is Caring conference with all the, talk, the talks and the speeches that had been held so far. Lots of good stuff there. Question five. Which German art museum was the first in the country to release their digitized collection into the public domain? Was it Museum für Kunst und Gewerbe in Hamburg? Was it Alte Pinakothek in München? Or Staatliche Museen zu Berlin? So, German art museum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful to see that there are more and more collections being opened up uh, in various countries. It's really... Oh, you got that one. Yay! It's Anche's Museum. <laughs> <laughs> we heard from you yesterday. Great. Great job. Question six. And remember to be fast. <laughs> Who issued a public domain charter in 2010 stating that works that are in the public domain should stay in the public domain when digitized. And this is also a type in question. We don't give you multiple choices here. Oh, no, so this is a hard one. It's, yeah. So the public domain charter from 2010, who wrote that? God, <laughs> I like that one. The correct answer is Europeana, and it's been such an important achieve achievement for our sector to have a statement like that yep. to put on our um, managers' tables. Exactly. Yes. Question seven. What's the name of the North American equivalent of Europeana? Is it the Digital Public Library of America, the Digital Public Museum of America, or the Digital Public Archive of America? <sighs> it's funny yeah. to see these uh, uh, big sort of super collections uh, around the world. There's also Trove in Australia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well done, you yeah. guys. It's the Digital Public Library of America. But the other names would have been pretty valid too, mm -hmm. I would say. <laughs> <laughs> we had fun making the quiz. <laughs> Question eight. What does the acronym IIIF or IIIF stand for? Is it Internet Images and Function? Is it International Image Interoperability Framework or is it Initial Information Integrated Facilitation? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a very bad quiz host. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. So yeah, good. let's see. We it's it's true. It <laughs> is <laughs> you knew the that. International Image Interoperability Framework. The other ones were pretty silly. <laughs> <laughs>
Question 9. Which of these three images are in the public domain? And um, yeah, you have some time to kind of uh, guess what it is. It's a bit hard one. Look Actually, closely, see what your art historical... Give you a hint, they are all from the Ism K collection. Yeah. So What's your art historical Google gut Google fast. Here? <laughs> Google fast. <laughs> Oh, yeah. It is number two. It is actually number two. I know it's a hard one. It's good to have a hard question sometimes. Mm -hmm. Can we see what it was? Yeah. It's called a Bill of Stockholm, image of Stockholm from 1970 uh, of Isaac Grunewald. Yep. It's all about when the artist died, as we all know. <laughs> Question 10. Which of these three huge online collections holds the biggest portion of freely reusable material with no restrictions? Is it Europeana Collections, the Smithsonian Institution or the British Library? And mind you, Europeana Collections is of course <laughs> huge, but um, we're asking what portion is freely available here with no restrictions. A bit tricky. Mm? See? Yeah. We tricked them. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually the Smithsonian Institution with 3 million freely reusable objects. 2 million approximately in Europeana and 1 million in British Library. Cool thing you knew all the numbers. <laughs> Question 11. Yeah. Cat. <laughs> Who created the original concept for the Smithsonian Commons back in 2008 and gave the keynote at the first Sharing is Caring conference in 2011? Type in the name of this great person. Yeah. <clears throat> the type ins take a bit longer. Yeah. What was the cat thing? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see who knew. Yeah? Exactly. It's Michael Peter Edson. If you typed in Edson or Michael Edson or any combination, you should also get points. And now we have question number 12. Let's it's like the Eurovision again. <laughs> yes. Which museum houses the original paintings behind these Playmobil figures? <clears throat> Is it the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, the National Gallery in London or Louvre in Paris? <laughs> they're not giving out the answers. No, oh. but they're here. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> you knew that one. It's the Reich okay, Museum. That's... <laughs> and thank you for that, Saskia and company. <laughs> oh, they are quite famous. Yes. Uh, question 13. We're getting close to the end. When were the Creative Commons licenses first published? Multiple choice here. Mm. Was it 1998, 2002, or 2007? Mm. Yeah. How well do you know your open glam history? Let's see. Yeah. Tricky. <gasps> Maybe that was for the yeah. image. Let's see. Time's up. That was correct. It Correct, was guys. 2002, actually the same year I was married to my Oh husband. yeah, that's true. <laughs> so it's a memorable year in many ways. <laughs> yeah. Question 14. Exactly. <laughs> Coming up. What was the first photo sharing service to implement sharing, no, oh, sorry, to implement Creative Commons licenses in 2008? 
The photo sharing service. Yep. The name of that. And type it in. Yes, it's a type in one. I think the type in ones are harder because you need also to you know, yeah. type right. <laughs> yeah, and on your little phone <laughs> yeah. and everything. <laughs> but just remember, it's just for fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the correct answer is Flickr Commons. True. Yeah. And now for the last one. Question 15 of 15. Which one of these fine people has not been a keynote speaker at a Sharing is Caring conference? Is it Shelley Bernstein, Charlotte Isho Jensen, Mia Rich, Melissa Terras, or Elizabeth Merich? Who was not a keynote speaker in the last 10 years? Yep. Google fast <laughs> again. <laughs> oh yeah, that's a hard one. But actually the majority got it right. So Charlotte Esho Jensen may not have been a keynote speaker, but she was a key figure in the history of sharing is caring and in the dissemination of open glam in Denmark and beyond. A catalyst for crowdsourcing of cultural heritage she was the brain and heart behind the 2014 edition of Sharing is Caring, working with our users. We lost her way too early in 2019, but her inspiring work lives on in all of us who have been touched by her commitment and generous spirit. Yeah. We miss you, Charlotte. We miss you. Mm. But we still need to have the answer. Yes. Who are the winners? Are you ready, guys? <laughs> Press the button, I, Okay, okay. <laughs> wow. Let's see here. <gasps> it's a close race. I think it's Henriette Earth was man. number one, <laughs> and then Derwin, and then Cake. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> Will you tell them? To yes. Give us an so, hour show. Yeah. We, we can maybe guess who's behind your uh, game names, but please announce yourselves in the chat. Uh, who's behind Henriette, Derwin, and Cake? No, Earthman. Earthman. Sorry. Sorry. Earthman and Der Derwin. Sorry, Cake. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay, um, Henriette, Earthman, and Derwin. Yeah. So we will um, reach out to you and send you your cool prizes. This is the first prize, the thousand piece SMK puzzle. Yep. Carl uh, Blocks, um, famous uh, Roman Osteria scene from 1868. Uh, number two, Earthman one. A nice uh, tote bag with um, a picture of uh, Wilhelm Hammershoi from uh, Copenhagen uh, Street uh, environment. Yeah. yeah. And who was it? Duren? Yeah. You won. A music box. Can, can you try to play it? It has a nice little melody. Maybe if you place it on something. Or my... Um a little oriental tune to go with Elisabeth Jaikau Baumann's painting of um, an, uh, a woman in Gizeh, Egypt, from 18, the 1870s. Yes. We will send it to you if you give us your uh, yeah. We can we can find out. We will we'll con contact each other and uh, and we'll get your addresses so we can send it to you. Thanks very much for playing along. And, yeah. um, well, well, <laughs> do we have everything? <laughs> yeah. Where are we in the program? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, this is a completely new uh, kind of uh, skill we are trying to develop to be uh, TV hosts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in game shows. <laughs> okay. Now we are going to our um, second Ignite session of this conference um, to explore new best practices together with four fabulous colleagues from our sector. Uh, they will talk about 
the initiatives they have taken um, to further open GLAM, initiatives that have grown and shown their value to people and society, sometimes to the surprise of the GLAMs that made their collections openly available. So please um, welcome in consecutive order Jakob Wang, Stig Svenningsen, Barbara Fischer and Jonathan Beck. And we'll play four videos now um, without interruptions and um, then go to a chat with the Ignites. Enjoy. Hi, my name is Jakob. I'm with the National Museum of Denmark. Uh, I've been a part of running cultural heritage hackathons in Denmark for the past roughly 10 years. Uh, we've been calling it Hack for DK all along. Um, the outset of the initiative was back in 2011 and based on the realization that although, although we are fairly creative and productive, uh, being glam professionals, obviously there's a lot of smart, clever and creative people not working for glam institutions. So what we set out to do in 2012 was to invite volunteers uh, outside of our organizations to experiment and uh, be creative working with digital heritage material from various Danish glam institutions. Um, Obviously, we wanted to try to challenge the practice that uh, that we had at that time and still have, uh, inviting someone other than ourselves into the uh, creative space of figuring out how to use um, digital heritage in new, um, interesting ways that might not be the traditional ones that are coming out of regular institutions. So in 2012, we basically just in, tried to invite people uh, to see if, if they were actually willing to be part of a creative weekend. We held it at the Royal Library in Copenhagen. And um, we were pretty much just yet curious to see if anybody actually showed up at the event, which they um, luckily did. And, uh, and since then, we've been having Hack for DK weekends uh, annually at various Danish uh, uh, cultural institutions. Um, we've always tried to balance how to engage with, uh, with the people attending the event. One of the issues or challenges we've had is that, that we early on saw that there was a, a, quite a, some variation in the needs among uh, the participants in terms of facilitation of the event part of the uh, participants actually wanted to be left alone with the content that that institutions provided for the hackathons and figure out which groups they wanted to work in and who they wanted to collaborate with while others had a need for a more firm kind of uh, facilitation getting help figuring out which groups to work with and which people to group up with and and also help in figuring out what ideas or projects might be the most relevant to work with. So from from year to year, we've always tried to like create a better event that kind of suits everyone, but it's always been kind of a challenge to, to actually meet that kind of, of need among the participants. Um, we've been very focused on having a hygglet event, a cozy event. Um, uh, that's been one of the primary focuses to, to, to create a very free arena for the participants to themselves figure out how they wanted to use or, or kind of leverage in terms of, of doing the stuff that they, they like to do. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of programmers, designers, storytellers, um, various kinds of people with various kinds of competences. Um, but we've always had a, had a big emphasis on on a very free kind of event. We've never had big prizes. We've never uh, focused a lot on what we wanted them to work on or what kinds of ideas we wanted them to work on. Um, that's been kind of one of the philosophies uh, around Hack for DK or throughout all of the years. Um, I'm just showing you a lot of images or photographs from the various events throughout the years to give you guys an idea of 
of the vibe there and and what it's been looking like and and uh, how it's been uh, uh, throughout the years so obviously there's been a lot of interesting projects coming out of hack for dk and and far too many for me to to kind of <laughs> go through just a, just a portion of them but uh, but i've picked out one in particular that caught my interest when it was created uh, during one of the events, uh, which is like a project that kind of um, fears a lot of different kind of aspects of digital heritage into one. So first of all, it's a, it's a data set based off of many years of, of substantial crowdsourcing on uh, records on citizens of Copenhagen. Those records have been transcribed by volunteers through many years. So that was the data set. The data set is used to create a visualization of uh, parts of Denmark where people moving to Copenhagen were coming from. And then I hope that you can hear it in the presentation. The music underlying the visualization actually automated, automatically uh, produced music based off of data points in the data set. So it's an, it's an automatic mm, uh, musical work based off of crowdsourced uh, digital uh, heritage collection uh, data. So I think that's kind of a very cool project that kind of feeds many elements of digital heritage into, uh, into one. Hack for DK numbers, uh, mm, there's been a variation of how many participants have been there throughout the years. Um, uh, paradoxically, the COVID-19 year, we, we never got around to actually having an, an event. It would have been obvious to, to use that uh, situation for all users of museum and archives being converted from analog into digital at, at a single event that would, that would kind of call, that would be a major call to action for actually digital heritage to kind of stand up and get on the scene. Um, but we kind of in certain ways didn't get around to it that year and and it turned out that the community is not a self-sustaining one it's very real re, it relies a lot on us doing an a, an annual event and a lot of the motivation among the 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 the, the community um, members so to speak relies on on that weekend or the the physical event was was one of the realizations um so just a brief note on how we've organized the uh, hack for dk throughout the years. Uh, there's been a lot of variation among the, the organizing institutions. So if you want to be a part of funding hack for dk which is not very expensive when it, when, when it comes down to it, but, but if you want to be a part of uh, the organizational group, you are more than welcome. So we've got to have had a, many different kinds of organizational inst uh, institutions behind hack for dk throughout the years. And we've also seen quite a few people traveling through hack for dk or being a part of the event once or maybe twice and and then maybe not returning again so 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 it's a very kind of it's a very um fluid community if you will uh, and has been throughout the years um but we've throughout all the years tried to lobby by evidence for the value of open heritage data. We've been trying to lobby by evidence for the value of participatory and open design. And, and we've been lobbying for the value of, of free and, and creative communities and the power of, of, of letting uh, the creativity be free in terms of uh, digital heritage. Um, so we've definitely had, have had a lot of fun. There's been many, many ideas developed as part of hack for dk Some, some of those have actually made it into real life, which is also a, an, a kind of interesting point about hack for dk for it to be like a, like a, like, like a place where ideas or projects might be born and and turned into like real life projects there are uh, quite a few examples of that from hack for dk and um, and then we've ob obviously used hack for dk as glam professionals uh, at least for myself in, in my case as a as a place to kind of to kind of give birth to new ideas that have been developing one of the big projects that that, are, that i've been a part of launching at the national museum has been most definitely based on 
like um, development throughout the years with this kind of creative community and and like um, making the idea even more and more like clear throughout the years and and now we've actually launched a project so that's a, that's a cool thing and an interesting thing about hack for dk as i see it so i just want to uh, end this brief presentation uh, the way that we normally kind of end the welcoming at hack for dk which is have fun happy hacking so thanks a lot everybody This talk marks the 10 year anniversary of the Royal Danish Library Digitization and Crowdsourcing Project and Aerial View of Denmark. The project has digitized the library's collection of more than 2 million aerial images and made them available online. The collection basically consists of two types of aerial images, vertically and oblique. Here the two types are illustrated with the village of Fyn, uh, the village of Ørskov at Fyn. Initial oblique area images were remainly recorded of cityscapes such as this one shown in the Royal Danish Library and the harbor of Copenhagen in the end of the 1920s. In the 1930s, aerial photo companies started to record images of farms and houses in rural Denmark. And between 1930 and 1990, most Danish farms were recorded three to four times or even more, as illustrated with this farm from Fyn. Aerial images soon became an integrated part of rural culture and during the period from late 1930s to early 1960s, most Danish farms of a certain standard acquired aerial photos of the property and other kinds of merchandise. This huge demand for aerial images resulted in an emergence of several aerial photo companies, recording hundreds of thousands of images. Vertical images became widespread in the 1960s due to the demand for image for mapping and construction purposes. Millions of vertical images have been recorded of Denmark by several private companies as well as domestic and foreign government agencies. Vertical images are an important asset to document landscape change, uh, such as in this case with mining activities at Fitzdevens. Today, most of the, these archives have been acquired by the Royal Danish Library and the collection numbers several millions of aerial images. Retrieving of photos from the physical archive is time consuming because each company our agency had its own archive structure and registers. In order to find an image, one needs to consult up to eight different maps and registers. This is a severely limiting factor to the use of the archive. The difficulties with accessing the archive led to the development of a digitization project. And in 2010, the Royal Danish Library received a grant to start the project the digitization of aerial images for the island of Fyn. Today, the project has been expanded to cover all of Denmark. Digitization has been carried out by the Digitization Department of the Library since 2011. A special web portal was developed for the project, which both served as an outlet for the images as a, and as a site for user engagement in form of crowdsourcing. Photos were shown geographically on a background on historical and contemporary auto photos and later topographic maps. Users can geolocate images using the web portal. Red drops indicates a photo which has not yet been geolocated and green drops indicate a correctly placed photo. Users are giving three points for placing a photo, which has been a strong motivational factor. Top users uh, were presented on a, a scoreboard and some of them have placed several hundred thousand of photos. The crowdsourcing was a huge success and the users almost kept up with the images as these became published online. The workload of the crowd currently equals 80 years of full-time work. All data from an aerial view of Denmark are available as freely accessible data. The data is not only available at the web portal, but can also be retrieved through an API. This allows for a number of other users of the image, images. The huge number of geolocated images and the accessibility through the API means that the data from the aerial view of Denmark can be used by planning and regulatory authorities, as well as consultancy firms within construction, environmental management, and legal industries. This picture shows the Grinstead chemical plant in 1975, showing a careless storage of chemical barrels on open land, and indispensable information for potential future cleanup. The first case of professional use of an area view of Denmark is Fyn, which makes data available for the use in administrative systems and municipalities of Fyn. Data has also been used by Dean Geo, which enables the ability to view historical images of properties in relation to property sale. Another example shows how data is an important data source 
for environmental screening of potential pollutions, such so as this case from Ringe at Fyn. An overview of Denmark has been a great success in relation to user engagement and making historical image available to the wider public. However, as outlined in this presentation, open heritage data do in some cases also have a significant potential as key data source to tackle present day problems, such as environmental management, transition, transition towards a sustainable future and settling legal disputes. We would like to make the point not only to evaluate the impact of digitized historical data in terms of access to cultural heritage, but also as a valuable data source for a wider range of use within public sector and industry. Thank you for your attention. Hello, my name is Barbara Fischer. I work at the German National Library, helping to create an ecosystem of semantic data. You can become part of it. Give me five minutes to explain. The little bullet points in the right corner indicate where we are. First, we will talk on information retrieval in general. Second, on authority control. And third, on building an ecosystem for GLAM data. Today, we all embrace the digital turn even more than before. We shuffle more and more content online. Now, flip the perspective. How do you ensure that your data is found in the internet? The semantic web is today both more wanted as more people share content on the net and easier to achieve as the IT capacities increase. Unfortunately, we have no semantic web. We have search engines. Bottom up. One, a bunch of zeros and one. Two, digital, yet not machine readable. Three, structured and machine readable data as in Wikidata. And on the top, it relies on authority data, like the GMD in German speaking countries. I want you to consider the fair and care data principles whenever you generate data. Knowledge grows as it is shared. Share your data freely to increase the knowledge built on that data. The GMD is a powerful and data rich tool produced and used by libraries. But the digital turn has increased the interest to create more diverse authority records meeting the requirements by all GLAM and science institutions on FAIR data. All GMD records are CC0. They deliver persistent URLs IDs and disambiguation of the described entities. You can use them to improve retrieval and visibility of your data, plus benefit from approved content. The GND opening is a change process on four fields. Governance and rules acknowledge all active communities. Infrastructure needs to be both accessible and flexible. Communication becomes more complex and diverse. To edit authority data is hard work. Thus, we want to make contribution easy on a technical level. We looked around for a software app for collaboration, open source and interoperable. We fell for Wikibase. Wikibase is coded by Wikimedia Deutschland to serve Wikidata. Since 2018, Wikimedia is in touch with power Wikibase users to understand how to transform Wikibase into a generic software product. We use Wikibase in two projects. One is to establish GND Wikibase instance as a full operating second home to its master copy in the traditional software environment. We focus on both smooth import export, true synchronization and usability. Second, we transform the text-based rule set for editing the GND into a structured database. The ontology transform into items and properties. 
information retrieval and maintenance will become easier. Complementary to the functionality listed here, bear in mind neither Wikidata nor Wikibase target laymen, but rather data analysts who are able to handle at least basic coding. Talking to other libraries evaluating the software too, we would like to share our findings. We don't know if Wikibase develops from a unicorn to a working horse, but we go for it. Together with the staff of Wikimedia Deutschland, we will draft a model for common governance, improve usability features and agree on how our functionalities could best contribute. Yet there is still a lot to do. Most wanted is skilled personnel. There is a risk of lacking time to achieve our goals, knowing that powerful IT enterprises are working on similar services but license. Coming to an end, here's what you can do. Join the GLAM community in the Wikilibrary manifesto. We aim at connecting GLAM institutions and Wikibase in an international network of knowledge. Our goal, the creation and implementation of a single lingual open data network for art, culture and science. Help us to set up a common, our common requirements to improve Wikibase. The manifesto is open to sign. Let us know your thoughts and experiences, either right here on the conference or share out to me via email or Twitter. The slides will be shared with you. Thank you. Hello, I am Jonathan Beck, an artist, digital consultant and fellow activist for Open Glam. I'm also the founder and manager of the nonprofit initiative Scan the World, which is one of the few things I'm here to talk about in the next five minutes. Since its inception in 2014, Scan the World has become a living ecosystem of over 18,000 3D printable, free to download 3D models. Every 3D scanned artifact has either been produced in collaboration with cultural institutions across the globe or through contributions from, strong, from a strong community of passionate individuals created through harnessing open source software using the democratized process of photogrammetry. The collective effort is as much about renowned historical artifacts as it is about household antiquities with deep culturally significant roots. What we're creating is object-oriented narratives to provide context to our living archive, ensuring that takes precedence over profit or bureaucratic restriction. For museums, we provide a free 3D scanning service to help with the digitization and archival of the collection. In this, we run free workshops for internal staff and external visitors to get an understanding of 3D technologies. Our only condition is that you make the models available to download from Scan the World, which hopefully urges the topic of open glam into board meetings. We also provide free services for smaller institutions who do not have resources to open their collections. So where are we now? Fast forwarding to 2021 and the world seems pretty unfamiliar. The coronavirus pandemic has seen many of us staying inside without access to museums or cultural spaces. And like many others, we used this forced stasis as a means to reflect. And although I wasn't scanning in museums myself, it allowed me to slow down and focus on developing the Scan the World community. It's clear that culture is still as necessary as for humanity as ever, and lockdown highlighted this. To put this into context, from February to April 2020, we grew from 80,000 monthly downloads to 150,000. A lot of this traction is down to ensuring that we stuck to our core values of sustainability, purposefulness, inclusiveness and freedom, and keeping our models free and open for anyone to download. Community should be a key word in every institution's mission statement. Your special collections are not special without the context given by the community. In addition to the Wikimedia Foundation, we have since partnered with Google Arts and Culture to aid in community growth and ensure maximum traction for our partners. 
The intention of this partnership will be to create a bridge to allow for further broadcasting of the collection, as well as implementing a new open source 3D viewer to be embeddable anywhere. The data is still owned by the museum and all download links are hosted through Scan the World. As previously mentioned, our focus is to create a level playing field of cultural artifacts, keeping the community engaged with the project and developing a shared sense of heritage. This bridge between the community and the institution is relevant within the themes of decolonization and fair use of museum collections. I have started putting this into practice by passing the baton onto two new initiatives, Scan the World China and Scan the World India. These people are given the control to work with local organizations to provide appropriate context to their own heritage. When you develop the trust of your community, the community wants to give back to the project. We're currently looking into crowdfunding, crowdfunding through My Mini Factory as a means to get the project into new areas, allowing the community to decide what collections we focus on next. Many of you are most likely aware of the newest money-making and environmentally catastrophic fad, NFTs. These non-fungible tokens seek to monetize artwork and museum collections through exploiting their metadata by making the artwork a unique digital asset. Though this begs to ask, why is it okay for Getty Images to sell versions of the Nightwatch? Although we've seen a couple of crypto projects being created from CC0 models, we are looking at novel ways to protect the 3D models in our collection. In an attempt to refresh the way that institutions think about their digital collections, we are pushing for, a, for creating a decentralized ecosystem that allows and empowers a community to build and give context to the content. As every, uh, uh, every object tells the story, and Scan the World shouldn't be bound to one owner or one narrative. Every object comes from an original artifact, but it is also linked to the museum, an artist, a 3D print, a designer, photographer, writer, and so on. All of these are integral to the object's creation and purpose, so we aim to split the object's ownership into whoever has contributed or is related to the artifact. As the world of these technologies start to settle in the glam sectors, museums, we hope, will be able to consider the benefits of opening their digitized collections with the world. With 3D printed artwork sitting proudly in people's houses, museums are already finding their collections unlocked through the power of community. Looking to the future, heritage should not be reserved and interpreted by the lucky few. Instead, we should look to embrace digital and physical reproductions of collections to bring the narratives to the masses, encouraging knowledge to be disseminated by the people. Thank you very much, Ignite speakers, and thank you, John, for that phrase of uh, cultural heritage should not just be for the few. Um, I'm a trained art historian myself, and it's always been my goal to um, acknowledge that artworks were not made for art historians, they were made for people. So uh, that's a very important point. And C Christina just said to me after your talks, I'm proud of them. <laughs> <laughs> it's fantastic work that you're doing um, for the glam sector, for our communities. And um, it's great to have you here with us in um, the live chat. And uh, as with every one of these uh, open debates, please out there uh, in front of your screens, post your questions to uh, the people that we now have in the room so that you can pick their brains and learn more from them. Um, but I'd like to go first actually with a question for Jakob. You started out with your Ignite here and you've learned a lot from running sh um, Hack, sharing is caring, Hack for DK for actually also 10 years um, almost. Um, what's the most important thing that you learned from engaging with this hacker community? I think basically that, that there, there was and is a lot of great people out there that, that I've been happy to have met throughout the years that, that coming from, from, from institutions and, and being curious about 
who might be outside of the walls of our institutions and actually taking that step out there is uh, is not bad at all it's actually quite fun and and engaging and and also very productive as uh, to to be able to to kind of discuss stuff with with someone else rather than than the colleagues in the institutions and and another point would be because we also built hack for dk to kind of um to kind of get a strong uh, outset for the battles that we had within our institutions so we kind of i think most of the organizers behind hack for dk and the institutions behind it we wanted to use kind of the power and the energy and the drive of of all of those people that we met to kind of strengthen the argument within our institutions as, as well to actually show the the demand the need and the and the relevance for us to engage with with active participants instead of just doing regular uh communication to passive audiences so to speak so i think um, a lot of us traveled back into our institutions and used the story of of the wonderful things happening outside of our institutions as uh, as strong arguments in the in the small medium and and big battles that we had with our institutions uh, turning around towards the the open paradigm so to speak yeah I think we all know what you mean when you say small, medium and big battles. <laughs> we all have some kind of story there. Christina, there's uh, some questions from the audience. Yeah. Uh, Henriette Rud, you want to ask Stig. Do you think there is a pressure on GLAM projects like yours to encourage use outside of users with a heritage cultural interest? And if so, why? Um, thank you for that, that question. No, not really. Actually, um, it's I've, I've, from my perspective. I think it's more the other way around. Um, I think there is a huge potential for for this data we can generate in in our institutions to also be used uh, in other sectors than just in in the heritage se sector. But I think within uh, my institution, we often think of it, the data as heritage and and the um, and the interest. Um, groups uh, being the heritage community. And I think there's also uh, a big user potential outside of that, uh, especially for these, yeah, obviously these aerial photographs, but also other kinds of data such as uh, census data and um, yeah, different kinds of, of data maps where, where, and, and so on. Um, so I think it's, it's important also to uh, remember that when making cases for digitization projects and so on, that there's also uh, other uh, user groups uh, than just the hair change. Steve, yeah. when you uh, when you made your your presentation here, and also when I've been following um, an aerial view of Denmark uh, in the Danish news coverage, um, I've been wondering: Did you expect digitized aerial photos from the Royal Danish Library to be an important resource for the building industry when you ventured out on this project? Uh, well, I. I'd I was not uh, on board from from the start, but I, well, my background is in in geography and landscape research. So, well, I I, I think I've seen the potential all the way along, and and I think my colleague uh, within the the aerial photograph collection has also seen the potential. But I think for the management of the library and uh, when the project was initiated, I think the the the, the main uh, argument was uh, to to do this uh, as a, a kind of heritage project. Um, but uh, well, uh, when the data is out there and it's, it's freely accessible, I, I think the rest uh, more or less developed on the on its own. Uh, we did not do anything to engage to these uh, companies in using our data, so they found it themselves and asked to uh, if they could use it, and and so we went on. Yeah, then we, we went on onto national media uh, last summer with a story about the, the business potential of of the uh, an air view of Denmark. And that's that kind of crashed our server. Um, so there was a huge interest, but but that's more was more or less after the some of the companies have already discovered the, the data. I think it's it's interesting at least that uh, to uh, to the managers in Glam institutions and to the general public, there's a ton of surprises in what potentials actually lie dormant in our collections. Um, Christina, yeah. you have a question for John, right? Yeah. Actually, 
Henriette and Tor Davis, they both ask a bit the same question, so mm -hmm. I'll just read them both out. A sandwich. Yep. John, do you have, have any thoughts on how to include diversity in the artifacts or materials we choose to digitize and make openly available? And Tor asks, I'd like to ask John how museums can be allies in decolonization. All the best. Okay, good questions. Hello, everybody. How are we all? Um, so decolonization is uh, a fairly big topic. And because I have the privilege of being able to work digitally, uh, I work a lot more with the community, which seems to be a word which is uh, sort of quite integral to all of our practices and all of our, uh, all of our jobs is uh, people. So um, I was probably one of the, when I, when I first started the initiative, I was out scanning uh, with my phone. I went around the British Museum and I just scanned everything uh, without realizing that I myself probably had a bit of a waiting towards scanning a specific object. Uh, when coming around to uploading the objects as well, I would be writing uh, descriptions either from my own perspective or from the perspective of, of uh, the British Museum's curators, which isn't the most diverse collection of people. Um, so to avoid this, as I decided to expand and decide to continue with being community built by encouraging people around the world to tell their stories of their artifacts and heritage is for them to take the reins, is for them to, to write the stories themselves. Um, so that's why we started up Scan the World India and Scan the World China. Uh, Scan the World India is being run by a nice lady called Ashita Jane. Uh, she's an MA student who is working on... Uh, basically telling the stories of the lost Hindu female deities uh, who were subject to iconoclasm uh, in British colonial times. And that wouldn't have been something that I would have gone straight into, but I put my hand up, uh, put the, the, um, the work into another person's hands who actually knows stuff about it and it is actually about them. Um, so for museums, it's about connecting with their communities and thinking externally and taking the advice, uh, which is 100% better than uh, a lot of other people's advice uh, when it is their own heritage, and letting them contextualize, let them decide what is digitized, let them be part of the storytelling process, whether that be in the digitization, uh, whether that be in the curation of the objects which are chosen, or even the resulting information which is shared with that, whether that be sort of blog posts or informational texts which are featured uh, in the museum or even uh, online. Um, so yeah, community, give it to the people. Um, thanks, John. Uh, I just wanted to say Christina and I are on a steep learning curve of uh, being on camera here. I'm sorry that we just heard that sometimes uh, when we try to give subtle practical uh, notifications to each other. You can hear it. I hope it hasn't interrupted what our speakers have been trying to say. Sorry. <laughs> okay, Barbara, I have a question for you. Um, so for someone like me, Wikidata can seem very technical. I'm a humanist, sorry. <laughs> so how do you think that someone like me and others out there uh, with the same kind of cultural heritage background can, can can get into the game of structured data, understanding it, working with it. What's the elevator pitch for the library or archive or museum director that we want to convince about spending resources and time on this? Yeah, thanks a lot for that, uh, for that question. I was thinking when Jakob uh, spoke about um, Hack for Denmark or John spoke about Scan the World, uh, the connecting thing uh, of the two of them for retrieval in the internet where we all live more or less um, is the metadata. And uh, metadata is, is something we, uh, um, the better it is structured, the easier retrieval gets. So uh, if you don't know uh, where to look for a specific item, you will never go to the British Museum uh, on their website, but you will um, try to find it where you normally look for content, um, like in, in Google or in other search engines. And uh, there you will find the items that have good metadata, and you will find those items that have authority files connected or in, um, interwoven in their metadata 
um, because they will then help you to connect one item with the other. So you will find both the, uh, the stature that is maybe hosted in a museum in China, and you will also find um, maybe the um, report of, of a scientist that was working on that stature that is uh, hosted in a, a Smithsonian uh, collection or something. So in order to be able to really improve the retrieval of all our cultural heritage around the world, what you need is very good metadata. And that means that you need structured metadata. Mm. And uh, this is, uh, this, this let me, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm not a computer nerd. Uh, I'm a digital tourist, I always say, um, but that led me to, to work with authority files because I, I found that um, without that, um, reaching all our cultural heritage around the world is not possible. Mm. This was actually what Peter Kaufman was also talking about yesterday, that we need to make all the repositories of knowledge open and interlinked in order to verify information on the World Wide Web. So I, I guess that's a pretty good argument towards any director of a public knowledge institution. Christina, do you have another question from the audience? Yeah. Saskia Skeljens want to hear from Jacob. Did you receive questions from international institutions to participate? Or are you considering a kind of uh, hack for DKX? I noticed the question in the chat and I've been looking forward to actually answering it here as well. So actually I kind of see hack for DK as an X event in the first place, because back in, I think 2010, 11, Europeana did some hackathons and, and that was actually the first place I saw like glam based hackathons. So we noticed hack for Europe, I think it was called back then, but we also noticed that it seemed like the Europeana hackathons didn't attract as many participants that you would think a big Europeana backed hackathon would do. And our analysis kind of was that that, that was a, a little bit of a tricky community, so to speak, or a little bit tricky world to kind of build an, a, 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 a regular identity around being, Euro I think that's also the problem with the EU in itself. That it's, it's, a, it's a really big thing and it's kind of hard for, for people to kind of identify with. So we wanted to do the same, but we wanted to do it within a Danish context because we felt that that might attract more actually. So, so in that sense, Hack for DK is in itself from the outset uh, uh, an X kind of hackathon event, just a, a localized version of Hack for Europe. And that's also, I think, what, what we then saw, as, as was mentioned in the chat, that in, in that period from 12 and, and going forward, there was a lot of different kinds of Hack for Europe X events uh, um, in Scandinavia, in any case, which I know the best. Hack for FI in Finland, Hack for NO in Norway, Hack for Sweden in Sweden as well. So, so it was. I, I see it as kind of siblings, like spawning from from the initial initiative from Europeana in in that sense. It's interesting to see what the future holds for uh, Hack for DK. Um, Jakob, do you have any thoughts on that? <laughs> to be honest. Um, so, um, the institutions behind Hack for DK, as I said in my talk, has varied a lot. So, and and I myself, I think, has been one of the one of the one of the organizers that has been there all along, and um, and I kind of have this um, this longing for a new generation of people kind of stepping into it. In in some ways, I think. We, we, are, we are becoming a bit of a gang of, of open heritage old timers in Denmark uh, somehow. And I think that's a cool thing, but, but I, have a, I have a little bit of trouble seeing where the new energy comes from within the institutions. It seems to me new people like employed in Danish glam institutions, I, think, I have a sense that they are like engaged in different kinds of topics. And so I think we have kind of a, a task in like 
bridging into the new into the next 10 years if we've we've had 10 wonderful years i think with a lot of energy and and my thoughts are are revolving around the question of of how do we bridge into the next 10 years um I'm clinging on to hack for DK for life <laughs> and forever, <laughs> but I really want to to kind of um, to renew it as well. And I'm not sure the the old gang behind hack for DK is able to 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 kind of produce the renewal that is actually needed for it to last another ten years, so to speak. So, all of you out there who feel young, <laughs> we'd love we'd love to hear from you. I'm looking very much forward to the next yeah. hack for DK and uh, I, I know a, I know a couple of young stars who uh, who we'd like to hear from you know who you are cool. um, John I have a question for you I think it's mind-blowing how you've turned scan the world into a global community can you talk a little bit more about how you managed to build that up and how you keep people engaged Sure. Um, so I'm a very small team. Uh, as of about half a year ago, uh, I just got an assistant who's in the chat, I think. Hi, shout out to Elisa. Um, so being a small team meant that I had to uh, really focus on sort of being as streamlined as possible, but have like everyone sort of be as or be as a, a, a approachable as possible. Uh, so when I started the project, community was always in mind. Um, so I made sure that I was as transparent as possible with my processes, what I did, uh, thanking the correct people who got involved. Um, I started off with, after doing my scan of the British Museum, I did another scan a thon at the uh, at the VNA uh, and other museums after I got banned from the British Museum. Um, and I would just invite friends to come with me. Uh, I, I, I'm a sociable being, so I like to, to, to do things with people. Uh, and word kind of just spread from there. Um, I asked some friends who then had other friends who, uh, I have a photographic past, so a lot of people of uh, sort of my course mates and stuff wanted to join in as well. And word just spread. Uh, and that sort of core interest of people was very small to begin with. Uh, it took a few years for me to actually harness that community and figure out the correct narratives to share, which was universal and, and exciting for everyone. Um, so yeah, it's, I, I don't have a specific uh, one, one answer for you, um, but it is just trying to remain like sticking to your goals and sharing your passions with other people. Uh, say scan the world is my my baby is my art project uh, now on steroids i suppose um but i make sure that everyone who is involved in the project whether they're sort of scanning a sculpture whether they're printing a sculpture whether they're they just want to tell a story about a sculpture uh, i will give them the time of day um and give them the platform to be able to do so so liberating uh, the community liberating uh, my friends around the world um making sure that they're part of it in means that they come back. And I said in my presentation that when you give a lot, the community give back uh, and using Scan the World as a platform to allow for these people uh, across the world to, to be a part of it, uh, lets them stay, I suppose. Um, it's not really my project. I, I call it Scan the World and I kind of want it to be owned by everyone. Uh, I'm just the guy who's doing the emails and the clicking and the <laughs> everything like that. Um, but yeah, it's passion. It's passion. And I can tell from sort of everyone who's spoken in the past couple of days and previous sharing is caring conferences is that the passion is there, that it's enjoyable, but also has such a huge impact when it's uh, economically sustainable and open and, and friendly. And I think that Scan the World is a fairly friendly uh, project to be a part of. Um, so having people, um, having people, yeah, uh, <laughs> contributing and staying around just for, for yeah. the, the joy of open sharing and new technologies and the fact that it's open or very sort of, uh, sort of multifaceted in ways means that you can be a photographer or you could be a curator or you could be an artist or animator and you still have a, a home in Scan the World, I suppose. So it's, yeah, making it sure, making sure it's inclusive is the main thing. Cool. What you're saying about, you know, that it comes down to the passion of people. I think Susanna also uh, said that was uh, actually what drives the, <laughs> the, the engine. Um,
Do you have uh, maybe one last question before uh, we go to the next session? I have, but I just need to say you have more than clicking skills, John. We've seen your dancing skills <laughs> while scanning. <laughs> you have you're quite a ballet dancer. <laughs> Yeah. The movement, really? yeah, yeah, need... <laughs> okay, yeah. Tor Davis has kind of an open question, I guess, for everyone, also you, Marete. How might cultural institutions make community as part of their core tasks? For, ex for instance, their mission. Well, I can start maybe by saying that we just had um, uh, all staff, uh, you know, Zoom-based meeting um, to renew the strategy of SMK. And uh, there was a lot of bottom-up demand that community and uh, dialogue became more central to our mission. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to say that our, um, our directors listened and uh, took it into account. I think, again, like John, you were just saying, it comes down to people and it comes down to uh, putting it on the table and, and um, making a good argument. But that was a quick one from me. Hand it over to the, uh, the speakers. If I just jump in quickly there. Um, so yeah, I guess it's about sort of hosting as many external initiatives as possible, which is hard to do right now. Um, seeing as we're all kind of stuck inside. Um, but when we, everything gets back to normal, uh, making sure that you run other initiatives which might not make any money or anything like that, uh, but encourage a community to form around your museum. And whether that be sort of, or you just sort of split up the, the collection into various different things, whether that be digital or painting or, or curation or something and running these workshops. Um, but then also put the guidance to the community as well to help guide the shape of the, the museum or the initiative, which is easier said than done, well, easier said for me to do uh, because it's sort of just one or two people working on the project. Uh, but that's how Scan the World has grown in its own way uh, is by making the community decide what we're doing. Um, we're going into crowdfunding in the future uh, to help uh, shape the project even more, but we listen to every single thing that uh, the community says or the visitors say, um, and then that is used to shape the future of, of the institution or the scan the world. <laughs> I don't mean to cut you short, John, but uh, we're a little bit running out of time, uh, but I'd like to just do a very quick, like, five words round for uh, the three of you, Jakob, Barbara and Steve. Um, how do you think we can bring community into the core of our mission? Baba, do you want to go first? Yeah, um, I'd like to say it's estimation. It's estimating and putting value to what is coming out of the community, putting that in the center and making sure that you're, in, you're not having the dialogue just because of the dialogue, but you're really listening, as, as John said. So... The community will see okay it has an impact i think that that's the important thing give them the feeling that they do make a difference thanks barbara steve well i, th I think we uh, we need to improve in that uh, matter um, we were lucky with the the crowdsourcing on the uh, an area view of denmark um, I don't think we work so much with crowdsourcing in, in, uh, in uh, our other digitization projects, uh, but we, in our new digitization strategy, we have uh, digitization aimed at some certain user groups like uh, uh, search and explore and so on. So that could be a way, a way to, to build communities, but I think it's, uh, it's it, well, it's, yeah, we need to improve in, in, in that uh, matter. Thanks. Absolutely. Thanks, Steve. Jakob? Two things. I think you need to respect that communities are chaotic and self-directed things and as such very difficult to create from scratch so i don't think we should engage in trying to create new ones i think we should engage in trying to identify ones already in, in existence and then taking a very um like a, a respectful part of that existing one and then I think that 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 we need better like resource management within our institutions 
to create more more free time for individuals individual employees to engage in the communities the existing communities they think might be interesting or relevant to them and and that they can be relevant to thank you very very much for a great learning experience of having you four together in the same virtual space um, it's been been great to learn from your new best practices um, i hope you stick around for the social um, event also when the conference ends so we can pick your brains even more now it's a great pleasure for me to catapult us to perth australia for a live chat with george oates She's a designer and entrepreneur, best known for being the first designer of the photo sharing website Flickr and for creating the Flickr Commons program in 2008. After that, she moved on to work at the Internet Archive and Stammen Design. In 2014, she set up her own company, Good Form and Spectacle, and in 2016, launched the Museum in a Box a small internet connected thing that when you place a 3D print or postcard of a museum object on it will play the story about that object. Like this year's Sharing is Caring attendance, there's a box on every continent except Antarctica. It seems true of all of our speakers here that their talents range widely. George has also written the book If Only the Grimms Had Known Alice a retelling of the Grimm's brothers' fairy tales to include female characters. But today, she's here to look back at the history of open glam and ahead on the next frontiers for our sector. Thanks for staying awake for us, George. Hello. Hello. <laughs> How late is it in Perth? Uh, it's pretty late. It's um, <laughs> almost midnight. Um, but I'm very happy to be here and congratulations on your 10th birthday. Thanks so much. We're so excited to have you here with us. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs> it is a bit weird, but it's definitely my pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So I was thinking it's been well over 10 years since Flickr Commons was launched. What, what was that all about back then? <laughs> um, well, um, we were approached actually uh, by the Library of Congress in 2007 um, and you know they have a, a tremendous prints and photographs collection that they'd actually had online and available in high res for free for you know 10 years before 2007 but nobody was really using it. Um, so they were looking for a web 2.0 partner they called it. Um, Back then. <laughs> Yeah, um, but what they what they wanted was to try to join an existing community somewhere else that they could become a part of instead of expecting everybody to come to them. And I just think that was so clever, um, you know, and the right move turns out. Um, but, yeah, anyway, in, in the course of me working with the team at the Library of Congress, um, I noticed that they used this particular declaration, which is, you know, to the best of our knowledge, we believe there to be no copyright restrictions to this. Um, and at the time, I was really conscious that a lot of institutions were struggling to share things because they didn't know the provenance of the objects or the materials. So they were sort of really stuck and they were, you know, um, unable to move from that position. So that turned into the Flickr Commons, really, because I... I, I just knew that other institutions would be able to make use of that declaration, and uh, they did. So what's changed since then for open photo sharing? I mean, we started uh, out all being very um, optimistic and having all kinds of dreams for, for open sharing. Uh, how do you look at it today? Um, open sharing, well, I mean, I was gobsmacked to discover the um, survey, survey by Douglas and um, Andrea that came out uh, demonstrating very clearly that um, the global uptake of open licensing of 
digital surrogates of public domain works is just off the charts. I mean, it's nearly, you know, a thousand institutions around the world have taken that step. And for me, that's a wave, you know, that's a tidal wave of, of action and um, belief, uh, not only from the individuals within the institution who sort of said, we should do this, but also the bosses, you know. Um, and yeah, I think it's, I th it feels to me like the wheels are turning now. I mean, in terms of, um, you know, that kind of practice being pretty prominent and pretty well understood. Um, and I guess I'd also mention that I think there's been a shift in um, audience expectations around it too. Like I think the, you know, most of us now would go to the internet and expect to see the thing at the end of our search, you know, and I think that's a pretty big change too. Um, what, what do you think has changed in open <laughs> photo sharing in the last 10 years? Well, I think I'm, I'm wondering if we were naive to open up the way we did um, since, uh, you know, just in our own experience, um, we've seen, for instance, commercial exploitation uh, by stock photo companies of uh, our objects that we've, uh, you know, in trusting manner placed in the public domain. <laughs> yeah, but it is the public domain. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit of a toughie, isn't it? Yeah. When you're used to being so protective of things and, you know, wanting to make sure they exist forever, you know, dangling it in, into the public domain is, is quite weird. Mm. But it's, it's use, isn't it? It is use. And Even we... if it's too... I think it's been interesting Sorry. to experience in real tangible terms what it means to actually let go of control and see also uh, people then take that opportunity and build fences around the objects all over again. Yeah, I know. We just want to enclose things, don't we? We can't really handle <laughs> You can know, handle but, freedom. <laughs> but I guess I, I will say that lots and lots and lots of us can handle freedom really well and very pleasantly and with love and generosity. Mm. And there's only, you know, the NFT weenies who are just total losers and everybody knows it. And like, you're just going, come on, guys, don't do that. That's such a bad move, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a good but, point. You know, I, I have to quote you back to yourself, Marita, when you say, you know, we just want to lose control because we can't think of all the ideas. You know, we have to give stuff away. Otherwise, they'll just gather dust and nobody will see them ever, you know. It's true, and we have to, we have to uh, to remember that there's uh, there's much more uh, creative and imaginative reuse uh, than the opposite. They just make more noise, I think. <laughs> well, we should never base sort of strategic decisions on what the art market is doing, though, should we? I mean, that's just crazy pants. <laughs> there's also been. <laughs> new agendas arising in the past years about whose heritage it is that we steward in our collections and who has the right to decide how we digitize and make them available to the public. Um, what, are, what are your takes on how, how has the glam sector been handling that and, and where should we go from here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, um, it's such an energetic moment in our history at the moment isn't it um you know pe people are yelling alternate histories you know with riots and fire and you know murder and it's everything's so intense um and i think it this kind of social intensity can be very confronting for all of us but especially for the the gentle folk within cultural institutions um you know i think there are there are I mean, I've witnessed, but I mean, I'm joking. I shouldn't probably joke, but, you know, I've also witnessed on the other side of the coin, there are lots of initiatives around, you know, bringing different voices into museums, as John was alluding to just before. Um, there's a great um, collective that sort of came out of the UK called Museum Detox, for example, which is, you know, a whole bunch of um, just different voices that you don't 
normally see in a sort of white middle class female, <laughs> you know, um, zone that often works in cultural institutions. Um, but I think that it's tricky, isn't it, though, because project based interactions with new voices are very difficult uh, to sustain. Yes. And I think that's really a big problem because you know, we've been talking a lot about community building and that takes time and human effort and attention. And, you know, if this is just three months of funding from mm. some research body to, you know, get some people who don't look like you to come and look at stuff, it's just, you know, it doesn't work, does it? So you, we need a we need a much deeper intervention here. Um, I mean, yeah. personally, I think it's around hiring, you know, making sure that you're hiring people who don't look, you know, who are different to you, different backgrounds, different, mm. you know, countries, different languages, all that stuff. Yeah, and, and also like, <laughs> and like Cathy and Susanna were talking about actually investing in, uh, yeah. in the people, in the communities, in the things that uh, users are asking for, uh, and not uh, only in... <laughs> or primarily in the things that uh, glam people think are interesting and have yeah. been raised to like consider. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? I think there's still, there's still a threshold there, isn't there? Even after so much great digital work, I think there's a threshold there for the members of the public who still, still believe to a great degree that museums are a place to be respected Although, you know, arguably that's coming under fire. The sort of trophy cabinet model is falling apart now, isn't it? Because <laughs> it's just so imperial and scary. You know, the big museums are all scary in terms of how they got their collections. You know, yes. people know that now and they're like, ugh. Uh, but I, I think there's a balance to be struck there because there is also a lot of expertise and care and and humanity inside the walls. So, you know, I think you... You do still hold the, the trusted source and slightly venerated position because, you know, you are custodians and this is a very healthy human habit, you know. So how do we do openness in 2021? Um, yeah, I've been thinking a lot about this in my tiny, weird hotel room in Perth. Um, and um, I've been... I've, I've been comparing sort of um, digital practice for the last 10 years, which is, you know, to a greater degree sort of, um, you know, mile wide and one inch deep sort of transmission and interactions. You know, we're passing around millions of records, Europeanas inhaling the world, you know, which is great and we're pretty good at that. But the 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 colour around the objects and the interconnectedness around the objects is still quite thin, you know, it's still quite weak. So I'm wondering how we transition to um, inch wide, mile deep, especially in the context of trying to um, gather different histories around objects, you know, and I think it's, uh, it's going to take a lot longer than 10 years, you know, it might be this might be a 200 year project mm. and, you know, changing the time frame uh, and giving yourself time to really imagine what 200 years worth of work might be to re-describe, -de re republish, recontextualize, reunite, you know, your collection with its owners. Uh, it, I mean, it's a, it's a long-term gambit, isn't it? Um, yeah. Thank God we're in the forever business. <laughs> exactly. I mean, this is a rare position as well. When you compare it to you know, a corporate existence, it's it's um, it's uh, it's really different and special. But I also did want to make a, a spe specific mention of um, something I was happy to hear Barbara mention too, which is about um, you know, if you if you are trying to shape your institution to um, not only um, attract but absorb different histories at the sort of you know informational level and sort of structural level you have to be super careful don't you and um the, she mentioned the care principles which i hope everybody is aware of and is reading about and uh, um, learning uh, but also i wanted to make mention of um traditional knowledge labels 
Um, I'm not sure if that's a big thing for you, but it's sort of a, it's a model that operates a little bit like the Creative Commons licenses um, and also, um, you know, what you see on the outside of food packs, yeah. <laughs> which sort of describe the contents. But it's a, it's a way to um, um, uh, acknowledge and state clearly um, what different sorts of ownerships might exist around objects. And I think that's super important because you know, being open is great, but it's not always safe for the subjects of the of the materials that you're sharing. And that's so important to understand. Yeah. Andrea Wallace, who also is, is one of the people behind the big, wonderful spreadsheet of uh, globally <laughs> open clam institutions, is also in the process of building um, a very approachable website uh, for GLAMs to understand uh, traditional um, object labeling. Yeah. What's it called? Sorry, I, I said something. Um, What's it called? Traditional knowledge labels. Thanks. Um, <laughs> you can go to um, localcontexts.org, I think is the home for it. Yes. Uh, yeah. But please, uh, everybody read up on it and, and figure it out because I think it's really good and important. So, uh, George, time is running on us, but uh, we've been yeah. both looking back and looking ahead. Um, but uh, I know that uh, while you've been uh, in quarantine in your <laughs> weird little hotel room uh, in Perth, <laughs> uh, you've been cooking something up. So what's sort of in the, in the near future for, uh, for you and the work you do? Oh, well, thanks for asking. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so, um, it turns out after... Um, after what is it 12 or 13 years now i'm gonna i'm gonna go back to Flickr, um because the Flickr commons program is is uh well it's languished frankly over the last decade or so um so um ben and the crew over there have asked me to come back and breathe some life into the Flickr commons again um which i'm super excited to to do and um yeah so i've been sort of looking at the state of the union, union over there. Um, there's uh, 114 organizations in the commons. Uh, we we wanna grow the membership and we wanna put energy into that. We wanna improve the features for the existing members. Um, and, you know, I'm just going in there with a bunch of energy and a big smile just to see what I can do. <laughs> um, so yeah, let me just say that if there are folks um, listening in um, and you've got photo collections that you would like to, to share, especially some of the folks who are asking about how to develop community, um, just like the Library of Congress did back in 2008, they joined Flickr to join a community that was super into photographs. And, you know, even though Flickr's had a bumpy ride over the last decade, there are lots of people still there who really love photography. And, you know, I know the Scandinavia has a really big presence in the Flickr Commons, so Thanks, you all. Um, um, and uh, you'll probably be hearing from me because I want to talk to you about how it's going. So, yeah, I've, I'm, I'm going to go back to um, help out Flickr Commons, which is uh, woohoo. That's so exciting, George. And um, yeah. it's, it's quite convenient too for all of us that uh, you're with us here today because uh, then you, you can give us a, a, a like uh, the chance to uh, reach out to you if, if some of us might have, you know, a collection that might be aptly suited for Flickr Commons and uh, we'd like to reach millions of users. So um, maybe uh, Jonas, can you bring on the slide with uh, get in touch with George? There's uh, your Twitter handle, your email and uh, also maybe you want to say something about what you're going to um, announce on your blog, on Flickr's blog? Um. Well, it's basically that um, <laughs> that we, we that the company wants to wants to put energy and resources back into Flickr Commons after having it be, you know, practically dormant for this time. And you know, just like we were sort of talking about, um, you know, you're in the long game and corporations aren't. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm one of the reasons that I'm returning is because uh, Ben and Don who. Um, acquired Flickr, they, they, they're in it for the long game. And yeah, so we, we're just thinking about um, a six month piece of user research, uh, which is gonna be a lot of interviews, talking to people, not only people who are already using the commons to find out how they're doing, but potential members, and also this, the broader ecosystem. Um, 
you know, we've mentioned the E word a few times now, <laughs> but Flickr, Flickr's got really good pipes and it's very good at sending well-described photographs around the internet. Um, you know, for example, pumping stuff in a Wikipedia or, you know, internet archive or I don't know, even in and out of Europeana. We, we don't really know yet, but we want to make sure that we um, ensconce it even further into the infrastructure of digital cultural heritage. Cool. Thanks so much, George, for um, calling in here to be with us uh, this afternoon yeah. slash late night. <laughs> I'm not um, awake now, so I'm not going to come to the party. <laughs> yeah, I was hoping that you might join the, the after party because I'm feeling confident that there's a lot of people in the audience and in the community who would like to uh, chat more with you uh, about your exciting plans for Flickr Commons. Thanks so much for sharing it here with us. And congratulations on your new fantastic endeavor. <laughs> Thanks, Renata. Thanks. Good to see you. You too. <laughs> and with this, um, we have reached kind of the conclusion of Sharing is Caring's birthday. <laughs> <laughs> that was loud. <laughs> and, and champagne. It's time to pop the bottles. I hope you all have an opportunity to do something like that. Of course, we would have loved to have 200 bottles of champagne and pour it all over you guys. But that will be next time we're all together in a real physical space, hopefully soon. Ooh, thanks. It's been a true pleasure to celebrate the 10 year anniversary of Sharing is Caring with you all. And um, yeah. what do you think, Christina? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'm happy to hear that both Keynotes and Ignites uh, tell us that it matters to share and open our content and our collection. So I will say my belief in open culture has just been renewed and sharpened over the last two days. Openness do really have an impact on our culture. It does. And I was thinking maybe you'd like to all um, think about what are your main takeaways from this conference. Um, you can share your impressions in the chat. Just do, you know, one, one word, the first that pops into your mind. That would be fun to see. And um, we'll, of course, also um, meet in a few minutes in Wonder Me. I hope you all got the link to that. Um, if anyone is missing a link, um, maybe just ask in the chat if someone will share it with you. I've seen out of the corner of my eye, some of you have been trying to reach me these past days with, can you send me this or that? And it's been impossible to, you know, be everywhere at once. But I hope all of you have managed to get access to all the spaces you needed. Um, and otherwise, there's a very helpful community. But I look forward to hearing your impressions. Um, the recording of the conference and the individual talks will all be made available um, CC by SA on SMK's YouTube channel uh, soon after the conference. Um, and uh, we'll, of course, send you an email when uh, it's all ready to post. And I'd also uh, like to say that uh, please remember that you are welcome to get in touch if you have an idea for a ShareCare X conference um, in your local GLAM community. There's both, uh, you know, you can get in touch with me or um, the four nice people uh, who were told about um, running with the conference themselves in their local uh, environments. So, um, What's yeah. left to say, Christina? A couple of things we have on the, on the list. Yeah. Yes. We want to thank all of you. We want to thank all of our wonderful, inspiring, creative, fantastic speakers and presenters. Thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing your knowledge, your experiences, your incredible hands and hearts with us. Um, we're learning so much from you. Thank you to all participants from all over the world. It's been wonderful to meet some of you, um, both uh, in the chat and uh, on Wonder Me. And I hope that we can all get together much more in the future. Thank you also to um, <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm, thank you. Oh, I'm getting <laughs> overwhelmed now. I want to thank um, Larissa and Saskia for uh, coming up with the idea to uh, host uh, a social space on WonderMe um, outside of the formal conference um, room. That was uh, a really the addition that made Sharing is Caring um, whole. We want to thank uh, Jonas and Lars from Signal Media who have run uh, all the tech and all the behind the scenes. It's been a great collaboration and uh, we really had fun with you and we think you totally uh, stepped right into the Sharing is Caring spirit. So thank you for that. And finally, we also want to thank um, the Nordea Foundation for making uh, SMK open and Sharing is Caring possible this year um, for great support for developing digital museum practice. A special thanks goes out to Jonathan Beck from Scan the World, whose beautiful scans of um, sculptures at the SMK collection has been gracing um, this conference visual um, looks. And um, yeah, it's just fantastic when people share quality. Yeah, we made use of it, at least. Yeah, lots of people do. So, so. Um, before we uh, end completely, yeah, it's maybe a, a good time to raise the glass because um, soon we'll be able to meet over in WonderMe, thanks to Larissa and Saskia. Um, they'll open up the space uh, very soon and we hope to see many of you there to toast to you and um, to uh, say thank you and congratulations to all of us. <laughs> That's it, guys. <laughs> See you again soon. Bye.